Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. It's always a pleasure to be anywhere where the Rumi Forum is being, especially when there's food involved, and there's always food involved, so it's always a pleasure to be here. <laughs> um, Sitki actually asked me if I would say a few words about Ramadan uh, in the context of and with respect to the human family at large, and that's really an easy thing to do when you think about what the idea of fasting is as a, a kind of human endeavor which co cuts across the myriad cultures and civilizations that define humanity. Fasting is one of the ways in which we discipline ourselves and separate ourselves, separate ourselves from the other species, the other animals that have aspects of themselves in common with aspects of us, but who presumably eat when they need to eat, and if there's food there they eat even if they don't need to eat, but don't have the capacity typically that we humans are imbued with to choose not to eat even when we want to eat, to choose not to eat even when there's food around us to eat. And so that's something that we share in common with each other. And interestingly, across the various cultures and civilizations, the different religious and ethnic groups that have their own traditions, there is repeatedly to be found a tradition of fasting that is connected with that idea of self-discipline, the idea of reflecting, uh, taking time and space and in a sense being away from our ordinary being, our ordinary time, our ordinary space to think about where we fit into the world and how we fit in with each other. So that, for example, on the Jewish calendar, when one looks at the Abrahamic traditions, we are approaching the fast which will be the most important day on that calendar, the tenth day of what is referred to in the Torah, or Taurat, as it would be said in Arabic, the Taurat, the Torah, the tenth day of the seventh month that will later on be referred to as Tishrei, that will be called the Day of Atonement, Yom HaKippurim, and it will mark the culmination of what currently Jews who are traditional and uh, observant are engaged in. In the month that precedes Tishrei, the entire month of Elul, they are starting to think about things, think about the year that passed, think about the year that comes. And in the Jewish tradition, the culmination of the month of Elul then leads to the month of Tishrei and 10 days that are called the 10 days of awe in which one is expected to even one's moral bank account, not only with God but with one's fellow humans. So that in the course of that time, one not only is engaged in self-reflection and prayer but in reaching out to those whom one may have ignored or may have offended in the previous year. And the Jewish tradition has it that at the beginning of that month, the gates, as it were, of the Book of Life are opened by God, and on the tenth day, they're sealed for the year to come. And that tenth day is a solemn fast. So a traditional Jew will not eat actually for 25, not 24 hours, because you want to make sure you don't miss any piece of it. So you start a little before sundown, and you finish a little bit after sundown, so instead of 24, you fast for 25 hours. And if you're traditionally traditional, you don't bathe, you don't shave, you don't do any of the things you might ordinarily do. You spend the entire time in prayer, and in fact, traditional Jews pray three times a day ordinarily, and on the Sabbath, there is a fourth series of prayers called additional prayers, but on that Day of Atonement, one prays five times. So there are five groups of prayers. So it stands out in that respect um, strongly from the rest of the year. In a way, what one sees having happened is the reshaping of about two dozen different actions that when the temple in Jerusalem stood, the high priest would engage in on that day, which included, over the course of the day, four changes of his sacred garments, and which culminated with his entering the Holy of Holies, and only on that day, and they'd tie a rope around his waist, because if he fainted in the context of God, how would they get him out? Because no one of the high priest was allowed in, and only on that day they'd pull him out by the rope. That ultimately leads from this very priestly, highly ritualistic series of customs 
to a rather simpler people-wide custom of this extended fast and this extended prayer. And of course, one of the people back when the temple still stood who would have visited it was a guy by the name of Jesus of Nazareth. In the culmination of his career, he arrived in what in the natural scheme of things was the spring. Remember, the Day of Atonement falls in the seventh month, according to the Torah. So the first month is the month of Nisan in the spring, and that's the month which is marked in the Israelite calendar by the Passover. And that's when Jesus would have arrived into Jerusalem at the culmination of his public ministry. And it was there that he would be apprehended. It was there that he would be crucified. It would be there from there that he would be resurrected all in the matter of time during that period of the year. And over time, as Christianity has developed, and there are many modes of fast in the Christian tradition, in particular in the Christian monastic traditions, because as a monastic seeks to emulate Jesus by denying his physicality, and one of the ways we can do that is by denying ourselves food, which is so essential to our physicality. Aside from the various monastic movements that prescribed various and sundry kinds of feasts, what became pan-Christian was the, uh, or fast rather, what became pan-Christian pan was the fast of Lent. Lent which, depending upon which kind of Christian you are, offers this or that mode of abstinence, whether it is total abstinence all day long, or whether it is abstaining from a particular delicacy all day and all night long for, 40 year, for, for a 40 day period, 40 days being the traditional length of Lent that begins in the Western Christian traditions on Ash Wednesday and the Eastern traditions on Ash Monday, and that culminates with Easter that celebrates the resurrection of Christ 40 days later, except in some traditions it's more than 40 days. So the Ethiopic Church and the Coptic Church and the Eritrean Orthodox Church, for example, celebrate Lent for 55 days. So each of these traditions has within itself sub-traditions with respect to the particulars of how abstinence is practiced. The idea of Lent, of course, is penitence. The idea of Lent is prayer. The idea of Lent is alms. It's self-discipline. It's the same sort of issues and ideas that attach themselves to the 10th day of the seventh month for a 24, 25 hour fast for Jews in Christianity for a 40 day period that culminates with Easter, some of the same sort of uh, principles obtain. And the notion of 40 is most specifically connected by Christian tradition to the notion of Jesus himself being out in the wilderness for 40 days where he experienced all kinds of temptations that he resisted before beginning his culminating public ministries which would culminate the culmination with his arrival in Jerusalem and all of the events that transpire there. And as Lent spreads out from Ash Wednesday to Easter, the various traditions emphasize various particular days among those days. So uh, all share in common, for example, the notion of the sixth Sunday being Palm Sunday, which actually marks Jesus' arrival into Jerusalem. Or the Wednesday that follows, known as Spy Wednesday. How many people have heard of Spy Wednesday here in Washington with the Spy Museum? But what's it about? It's the day when Judas spies on Jesus as he's praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. So there are well-known and less well-known features of the Lenten period that culminates with Easter. And within the context and against the background of these two Abrahamic traditions, Judaism and Christianity, of course, the prophet Muhammad appears on the scene in the seventh century. And in the text that records the teachings of God through him and to his constituents, known as the Qur'an, we are told that you are commanded to fast as others before you have. So the Qur'an lets us understand that the Prophet, peace be unto him, recognizes that he is working within a tradition among traditions and that there are precedents for the notion of the discipline and the self-reflection that fasts imply. And one of the early hadiths specifically says the Quran is referring to the Jews and to the feast, uh, the fast rather, the Day of Atonement. Other commentators say no, 
it's really referring to the Lenten abstinence of the Christians. It doesn't matter. It could be referring to either, neither, both, more. The point, of course, is that he enjoins his followers to fast during the nine month, the month that had been known as Ramadan even before Islam came into play in that part of the world, and to engage in acts that in particular would acknowledge what we are as a species apart from other species and emphasize for us patience, humility, spirituality, almsgiving, charity, supplication, prayer is all part and parcel of Islamic life throughout the year but in, particularly, in particular during the month of Ramadan. And during the month of Ramadan one fasts from sunrise to sunset and as sunset arrives one feasts, as Jenna pointed out at the outset, with one's family, with one's friends. It's a time to visit. It's a time to spend special time with those whom one loves. That's what the iftar feast is about.